All right, the mom had to Somebody asked me who my favorite Giants or baseball player was, um, and how many how many games have I been to. If we're talking Giants, I think I, I'm kind of biased at this point because my youngest son is named Kuiper, part of after Dwayne Kuiper, um, just because I grew up listening to Dwayne Kuiper and he's the commentator for the Giants. He played short or second base for them, um, and he's always like a just barely hanging on, not, you know, almost getting sent down every year. It was always like, just because he was really scrappy and good in the club, he stayed in the major leagues. Um, and, uh, you know, if you have a, a third child that is six years younger than your middle child, um, he's going to have to be really scrappy and hanging in there by the skin of his teeth, too. Uh, it's also for the kind of development as well, good inside the science sports with the third, third child, so we would vote. Um, so I guess I have to say Queen Tiger now. Um, that the commentary, the broadcasting team of the Giants is just phenomenal. They can make a, a blowout where your team's losing worth watching just because of the way they, they interact with the, the fans and, and talk about things. Um, I've been to a fair bit of baseball games. I think if you count minor league college games, I think I've been around 150, maybe 200 games. Um, but and if you're talking just Giants games at, at Oracle Park, I think if you I think I'm right around 30 or so. I don't remember how many I went to you know, as a kid a bunch, but I had, um, I've always been a big Giants or a baseball fan in general. Not as big as Bruce. Bruce goes to the baseball induction every year, the football fan induction every year, the first down. Um, so he enjoys it that much, and we always run into him. If you go to an Aces game in Reno, um, I've got probably a better than 50 50 shot at running with Bruce. Um, he's always there. He doesn't have season tickets anymore, but he's still there for half the home games, uh, especially if you can get him playing the Green Years. He was with the Mariners AAA team versus the Mariners fan, poor guy. Um, all right, other random question. I've heard that the universe is always expanding, and if it is, what's beyond the edge? The answer is nothing, because it's actually Base as a whole that's expanding. It's not just like the universe is growing into something that's already there. If you think about, if you think about as the universe as being the surface of a balloon, when you inflate the balloon, the surface area gets bigger, right? But it's not expanding really into anything. The balloon itself is not gaining mass when you stretch it out like that. Just the space on the balloon gets stretched out funny. So it's a weird thing to think about cosmology in general is a study of like the nature of space and the universe. And it's a it's a really fascinating mm -hmm. kind of, not kind of it's a very trippy field. For instance, um has anybody ever wondered what happened, what was before the Big Bang? Turns out that's not really a valid question because time didn't exist in our universe until the Big Bang. The Big Bang occurred, but there was no before the Big Bang. Time didn't exist. There was no cause and effect. Because how do you have cause and effect if you can't have a before and an after? Right? So saying like what's before the Big Bang or what's outside the universe is a little bit like saying what's south of the South Pole. Nothing. By definition, there is no south of the South Pole, right? Just try to visualize south of the South Pole while still staying on the globe. There isn't anything. So it's it's a really fascinating field. Um, and it kind of combines math and physics and astronomy all into one, one field at the same time. Um, so that's people refer to Stephen Hawking as being an astrophysicist, and he was, but really his biggest contributions were more in cosmology, the nature of the universe itself, um, rather than, than strictly being in astronomy. Um, and if you're really, if you want a good book to read by him about that, um, you could, there's a, you published a book posthumously um, called Big Answers, Brief Answers to the Big Questions. It's kind of an updated, a brief history of time, but it also talks about, about like questions that he got asked all the time. Highly, highly recommend it. It's pretty quick read each of the chapters, it's like 20 pages or so. Um, really, uh, really good, good way to get into thinking about time and space in the universe. Um, and 
What's my favorite part of teaching chemistry? Well, a big chunk of it is this part. When I get to answer random questions, when you guys ask, think about things in lab, when you're sitting around waiting for things to boil, hey, what is, what's going on with this? Or why does that happen? Or did you ever think about this? Those kind of questions are my favorite part. So um, keep asking me good questions, and I'll keep throwing it off here and spending a little bit of time to get a lecture on them. There we go. All right, we ended doing some practice with conversions the other day and those prefixes. So hopefully everybody still has their conversion sheet because I did not bring the um, extras, but I will grab, I'll throw the conversion sheet, conversions up on the screen here in a minute um, for anybody who doesn't have a copy. I think everybody in here right now is here on Tuesday, right? So everybody has a copy? Or at least would be going to copy whether or not you want to bring it. And I think we did these two to begin with, right? For practice with, and then we did uh, make a feet. A question about make a feet into centimeters or something or kilometers. So there's more, much good practice here. That cross up the ones we already did. We're doing 52.4 millimeters into centimeters. Oh, did you have a question? You just kept it on. Okay. That's fine. Sometimes I, I, you know, you scratch your head and I think that you're you're asking a question. So just feel free to tell me no, no question. Millimeters to centimeters. You can just shift it by one. That's what you're doing. Shifting the decimal by one. Um, again, but to make sure we go the right direction with it, it can be helpful to show that conversion, right? So fifty-two point four millimeters. And a reminder that there's 10 millimeters in every centimeter, or since a thousand millimeters is equal to one meter, you can write it like that. And then one meter is equal to 10 to the two or a hundred centimeters. Or you can condense that down and say 10 to the three millimeters is equal to 10 to the two centimeters. Right, because they're both equal to a meter, they're equal to each other as well. So, which way do we have to shift the decimal then? We're going to be dividing by, by 10, right? It's the net result of this. So, 5.24 centimeters. All right, let's go miles to inches next. So 1.0 mile. This might be a Convenient place to remind everybody to be careful when you're writing your units with your capitalization, both for variables and for prefixes and units. Um, because not only do the prefixes get weird, capital M means mega, lowercase m means milli, the units themselves get weird. Capital or a lowercase m as a unit means meters, right? The capital M in units means moles per liter. It's a unit of concentration, not meters. And if we're talking about, about variables, capitalizing things mean something different too. Um, for instance, we use this in, in lab today. In chemistry, lowercase d is density. What's capital D? Anybody want to take a guess? We use both of them in lab. No, not degrees, diameter. Degrees, we just use that degree symbol, a little circle. 
So with variables, with units, with prefixes, we got to be careful with our capitalization. And we haven't even got into the periodic table yet where we have to worry about capitalization, right? So when in doubt, be very explicit with, is that a capital or a lowercase? And I'll remind you gently without penalizing you too much if you get things mixed up. The main thing I'm worried about is that you confuse yourself. Like on that last problem on the, on the lab, where you had to deal both with a diameter and a density in the same problem, right? Really easy to confuse yourself and try and cut your density in half. At least two people did that. They, they cut their density in half to try and get their radius, right? Because they mixed up uppercase D and lowercase D, because I hadn't explained it like this yet. So, the other thing is with, especially with M in units, just an M always means meters. MI always means miles. What's one more that starts with MI that we need an uh, abbreviation for? I meant the, the way you would write the units, potentially. Mil mil millimeters does start with mi, we wouldn't write it as mi, that would be lowercase m, lowercase m. Minutes. Minutes. Minutes, all of a sudden, is in there too, right? So you never abbreviate minutes as mi. It always has to be min. Because if you write mi, that's a mile, not a minute. Really easy to wind up confusing yourself and have things not make sense if you, if you mix those things up, right? How the heck did I go from converting seconds into convert to miles? All right, so we're going to miles to inches on here. What step do we have to go in? What are we going to do next? Do we go miles to feet? We have a definition of a mile, one mile, 5,280 feet. And then we're going to need to cancel out feet. One foot is 12 inches. So multiply by 5,280, multiply by 12. Get something like 60,000, right? And how many sig figs do we get to keep? Just two, right? So that's going to make it 6.3 times 10 to the four inches. Good. So when it's straightforward length conversions, it's not too bad, right? When you've got a bunch, even if you have to do more than one step, okay, maybe it's a lot of writing. In a lot of places you could screw up writing into your calculator, but none of that's that tricky at this point, right? Let's do seconds to years, just for another good practice. So everybody write that number down. I'm gonna to switch to a white screen here. And I said that, and then I immediately did not remember what I'm doing. 34.57? 87. Thank you. S is the one that, that will occasionally, you will see two different abbreviations. SEC and S are both acceptable abbreviations for seconds. Um, that's one of the few. Trying to go seconds in years. We probably don't even need our conversion sheet for this.
So we'll see just how much of that got lost when I upload that. So that gets us to hours. Now, where do we go? Hours to days. We know an exact conversion for that, right? It's not about 24 hours in a day. It's exactly. Isn't it? Um, I guess hour is another one. H is technically what you're supposed to use, but occasionally I'll write HR just to make it clear what we're talking about. Um, no. It's exactly 24 hours in a day, unless you're talking to an astronomer and they, they actually make the, dip, the distinction between what they call side real days and calendar days. I believe a calendar day is exactly 24 hours, but a side real day is a little bit less. Spinning that way. So a side real day has to do with how long it takes to get the exact same point on Earth back to facing the sun at the exact same angle. But because the Earth is also moving at the same time, it's not, not just 24 days, it's a little bit less than 24 hours because you are also traveling along the path of the sun around the sun while you do it so you don't actually go through 360 degrees to get the same point on earth facing back to the sun but that's beyond this course that's something for you to learn when you take astronomy so for us 24 hours is equal to exactly one day so then how do we get to years Three hundred and sixty five. That one is that's the fun one here, right? Maybe fun is putting it too strongly. That's the one that's interesting. We're thinking about because is it always three hundred and sixty five days in a year? Why not? Leap years. Right, every fourth year we get an extra day on our calendar. That extra day is because it's actually more like 365 and a quarter days in one year. Except it's not even exactly a quarter. It's 365.24, which means if we follow our normal leap year, um, calendar every four years, we add an extra day onto the calendar. We're going to be off by a day every how often? 100 years. That's treating it like it's exactly 365.25, right? Like it's 365.24. We're off by one 100, which means we could be off by an entire day every 100 years, which is why every 100 years we don't have a leap year. I don't know how many of you were alive, let alone thinking about leap years in 2000, but we didn't have a leap year, even though normally every year that's divisible by four, we have a leap year, but not in 2000 and not in 2100, we won't either. And that accounts for that extra hundred that we're off. And then I, there's even more digits, decimals than that, where you can take that out even further. Um, I don't know. It's, it's really close. I think it's three, 365.2400 zero, zero something. So it will take us like another 10,000 years following this current system before we're off by a whole nother day. Um, so for now, this is a pretty good system. And the odds that we're using the same calendar in 10,000 years are slim to none. So that's, that's future human problems. So all we have to do is Divide by all these, right? 34.87 divided by 60, divided by 60, divided by 24, divided by 365.24. Which gives us what is an answer? Okay. 
And this is why we do the scientific notation. 10 to the minus 6, you said? Yeah. Four sig figs there. These are all exact. And we have five sig figs on our 365.24. If you only need two sig figs, three sig figs, you can just use 365. And that's within sig figs, you'll be right. You don't need the 365.24 to do that, right? But if you want more sig figs, you've got to use a more exact conversion. All right, any questions on this one? Anybody else want, want to get into the nature of time some more? What did happen before the Big Bang? No, not like that. What happened before time began to exist? Can you have time reserved before? Sorry, it starts getting really, really weird, right? You can't even say before the Big Bang or before time began to exist because there is no before time. Chris, and then Vanya. So uh, I've got a question on the previous one, actually. Okay. So why, uh, why didn't we round the sig figs on the first multiplication rather than waiting to the end? So because everything is multiplication and division, it's all considered the same step in terms of order of operations and PEMDOS, right? Okay. So with that in mind, we can round at the every step or you can wait to the very end to round and it shouldn't make a difference. The only time you have to round in the middle of a calculation is if you're switching between our rules for rounding. So if you go addition, subtraction, and then go multiplication, division, you have to do your rounding before you switch operations. But for all these conversions, they're all just multiplication and division. So you can wait to the very end to do your rounding without changing your answer significantly. Well, so, uh, so if you were to round on a 5,208 feet, wouldn't you get uh, 5,300 feet? That's an exact convert. So, uh, and we're only keeping two sig figs, right? So we wouldn't round the 5,280 to 5,300. But if you did, so one mile, 1 1.0 mile is 5.3 times 10 to the three feet, which then you're gonna take and multiply by 12, right? One foot is 12 inches. Within sig figs, you should still wind up with the same answer after the rounding. Well, because uh, why get the 5,300 times 12? Is what? It's uh, 6 to 3, 6. Uh, so 6.4? Yeah, so 6.4, and we had previously gotten 6.3. So we're off by one in the last reported digit, right? Right. Well, that's okay, because that's where the uncertainty is. The uncertainty is right in that spot already anyway, right? Yeah. By writing it this way, we're already saying, I might be off by a 10, right? Yeah. So that's why our rules for rounding are the way they are, so that it doesn't matter where you round, you should get something, even though it looks slightly different, 6.4 times 10 to the 4 and 6.3 times 10 to the 4. That's the same number, really. Okay. So, like, round is the average of something. Exactly. So, when you're taking the average of things, you're supposed to add everything up. Round using our addition rules if you have things with different numbers of or with different uncertainties, and then divide by your number of uh, measurements. Um, almost always, what you're going to come, especially if everything starts with the same uncertainty, you're going to wind up with something with the same uncertainty as, as your measurements initially. But there can be some weirdness with that, that occasionally. We're not going to get too bogged down in that because we're off by one digit. If you're ever unsure what to do with your sig figs, it's always better to lose a sig fig than to over represent how certain we are, right? So if you're ever unsure what to do, round an extra place off. We don't want to do that if we don't have to, do. but if you do wind up with a situation like an average or standard deviation where the math gets weird, you can do that. Bonnie, did you have a question? Can we answer it? Uh, yeah, five. Uh, so, uh, when you were doing the seconds to years, mm -hmm. my calculator ended at point zero 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 one. 
and that's it. And that's all I was getting. Yeah. So your, your calculators in general will have an, an op option that you can turn on to tell it to display in scientific notation where appropriate. Mm -hmm. So if you ever wind up in your calculator not showing you an unsafe fix for what you need to keep, you need to, to switch it and kind of display in different different notation, which on these TIs, let me make sure I'm saying this right. Um, on most of the TIs, the menu button or the mode. The mode button um, brings up a menu that has play to do, and it says display digits. And there's usually different options there that you can change to get it to display. You can have a float six. You float means just how many digits it's going to put out there. Um, you can change that or that. there's usually a way that you can get to display. There you go, scientific. Notation. So try it in that now. See if we can do something with an E in it. Yeah. There. <clears throat> um. So on your on the days conversion on our chart, it says approximately. So then, do we for the twenty four hours in one day, or for every one year to three hundred sixty five months? Right. So that one is approximate. So then, do we we don't use it for the same thing, right? It's not so. Exactly. We do, it means that we have to consider that. So let's say that we had, we we're trying to do this with six safe bits, and then we wind up using this conversion that only has five sig bits built into it. Well, if it's an approximate conversion that only has five sig bits, that means that's our lowest number of sig bits in our calculation, which means we are going to have to round off one spot more because we had used an approximate conversion. So I think the example that we did before was um, if we wanted with a really high number of sig figs to go from miles to kilometers. So let's see. Um, we'll do 5.2416 miles. And we want to put that into kilometers. Well, uh, the, on your conversion sheet, the conversion for miles to kilometers directly only has four sig figs on it, and it's an approximate one. So if we used that conversion, 5.2416 miles, and every one mile is 1.609 kilometers, we have five sig figs and four sig figs. So that means on our answer, we only get to keep four sig figs. So when you have if you have to use an approximate conversion, just know that that is a place that you might might force you to round off at the end. And in that case, it would be better in this case we didn't want to lose our safe thing. If we went to the trouble of measuring how many miles something was out to the ten thousands place, that's a lot of work to do that, right? We don't really want to round off that extra digit that we went to the trouble of measuring. So in this case, if we can get around it by only using exact conversions, then we get to keep all of our digits, all, all five of them. But in the case, in the time case, we don't have an option. The, the only conversion that you know only goes out to five sig figs. So we can't really do that conversion and keep more than five sig figs without going and looking up a better conversion. You could go out and look up the next several digits or something like that. And get a, a better answer. All right. Any other questions on the ones we've done so far? How we feel about conversions? Usually, when we start getting really nitpicky on some of the details, that tells me that we're understanding them fairly well, getting comfortable, comfortable enough to see the holes in, in some of the general rules we throw up there. Let's do one more just for the sake of this because we haven't done anything with volume really yet. Let's do 600 cubic inches to gallons. Is there anything particularly tricky about this? Jack? You're going to have to do the we do have to pay attention to the powers of the units when we start getting that for, for this one we actually have a conversion that goes cubic inches to gallons. 
comes directly from a derivative square. And because those are in the same same system, they're both imperial units. That's an exact conversion. Now I have no idea what's significant about 231 cubic inches that they chose that number to represent a gallon, but they did. That's an exact conversion. You can kind of see like an in inches, an inch started out as being the width of a of a grown man's thumb is roughly an inch. And so you can kind of see, and the, the a foot is literally the the length of somebody's foot. They just said, okay, this person's got a standard sized foot. They're, this is our definition of a foot. And then they figured out how many thumbs it took to make up an entire foot. And they said, okay, it's about 12. So there's 12 inches in a, in a foot. <laughs> so a lot of them, imperial units have bases like that, where they kind of have some sort of practical reason for existing the way they do. Like for instance, an acre traditionally was the amount of land that one person could farm on their own in a day. You could plow one acre of land a day. And so that was sort of the definition of what an acre is. Um, again, I have no idea where 231 cubic inches comes from to make up a gallon, but it is. It's, it's exact. So with that in mind, it looks a little bit different than what we're used to, but we still have a conversion that allows us to go cubic inches straight to gallons, right? So we just put 231 on bottom, inches cubed will cancel out inches cubed and one gallon goes on top. So we'll get something about two and a half or so, right? Maybe two and two thirds. What do we get? 2.597. And we would keep all of those, right? Because that's exact. And so is that. So our only approximate number is the four digits we started with. So we get to keep all four of our sig figs here. That seems like a lot of cubic inches for one gallon, right? But volumes are weird that way. Think about it. What a cube that was, let's see, what's a good even cube? Um, six cubed is something like, is something like 300, no, 216. So think about, so 216 cubic inches is a box that is six inches by six inches by six inches. All of a sudden, 231 cubic inches doesn't sound like it's all that much, right? It seems like a lot as a raw number because we think about 230 inches of close to 20 feet. But that's if you took your cubic inches and you lay them all out in a row. And you stack them in a square, volume cubes. All right. Here's one thing that, so in, in this week's lab where we were working with density, we had it set up a couple different times where we, we would say, okay, well, we know the density of water and we know the mass of water so we can solve for the volume of water, right? Everybody remembers doing that? I would hope since for half of you, it was you know an hour and a half ago. Um, that is one way to use density to convert back and forth between a mass and a volume. It's not my favorite way to do it though, because my favorite way to do it is just to think about density. Density itself is a conversion. <clears throat> Don't think about it in terms of algebra because there's always a place where you can screw up for an algebra, right? You wind up dividing by the volume when you were supposed to multiply by the volume or something like that. How many people messed up their algebra trying to get to their, you don't have to actually raise your hands, but it's a non, a non negligible portion of this room messed up their algebra trying to solve for volume, right? So, with that in mind, the way that I like to think about this is to just treat density like it is a conversion factor. So, let's use, we'll say aluminum, 
seven zero grams per milliliter, grams per cubic centimeter. Well, somebody who's had me in that class before, or some, if you feel feeling up for it, uh, anybody can answer this. What does per mean? For every one, for each. So grams per milliliter literally means for every milliliter, which means it is a conversion. It means that 2.70 grams of aluminum is equal to one cubic centimeter of aluminum or one milliliter of aluminum. If that's a conversion, then all you need to do to use to convert back and forth between mass and volume is to make the units cancel out. So let's do the same um, the same calculation that the lab had us do. Let's say we had, um, I don't know, 117 grams of aluminum, and we want to know how many cubic centimeters that is. If we have a mass and a density, yeah, we could plug in our mass and our density and solve for volume, or we just set it up so that grams of aluminum cancels out grams of aluminum. For every 2.70 grams of aluminum, it's one milliliter or cubic centimeter. Again, those are interchangeable. I'm just gonna try and keep it consistent so I'm not throwing another thing on top for you. Mathematically, this, you're gonna do the same exact steps that you would do to solve for volume here. You're going to wind up taking the mass and dividing by the density to solve for volume. But to me, this makes more sense. I don't, I don't even need to remember what the definition of a density is. I don't even need this equation. All I need to know is what are the units on a density. And then I just make the units work. If I want to go from a volume to a, to a mass, I make the volume units cancel out. If I want to go from a mass to a volume, I make the mass units can't splat. If those cross out, we're just left in milliliters. So we get something like 3.3. So Partly because I had conversions drilled into me very, very vehemently by my first science teacher in high school. But anytime I see a combined, this way I refer to as a combined unit, the mathematical term is a derived unit. It's a unit that's made up of other units. Anytime you have a, a derived unit like that, you can use it as a conversion. The trick is just understanding how to write it out and make the units cancel out. So speed is a conversion. Percentages are conversions, like we saw in the word problems this week. Now you could stop in the middle, solve your algebra equation, and then keep going on a conversion, or you could throw this one right in the middle. If I said, let's see, we'll use, uh, we'll use gold this time, 19.3 grams per cubic centimeter. If I said we had one gallon of gold, I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, if, if I said we had, had uh, two liters of gold, remember the symbol for gold is AU, so I'm just gonna use that as the abbreviation. And I wanna know how many kilograms that is. We can write that all out in just one conversion, one line of conversions, right? Because if we want to use cubic centimeters to convert to a mass, we just take our liters and we get to cubic centimeters. We get our, then we take our centimeters, get to grams, grams to kilograms. So what we could say one liter is 
a thousand milliliters. If you have your conversion sheet in front of you, you might notice it already has one liter, it's 10 to the three cubic centimeters explicitly written on there too. But if you don't remember that, you can just remember that you prefix for milli. And one milliliter is one cubic centimeter. Then we get to the point where we can use our density. We can say one cubic centimeter of gold is 19.3 grams of gold. And then we can say 1,000 grams is one kilogram. To me, that's a lot faster and easier than getting to cubic centimeters, stopping to plug it in and do some algebra with the density equation, and then taking the result and plugging in and doing one more conversion, right? Why not just do it all as one conversion instead of stopping in the middle and doing algebra where you don't have to? All the only thing you have to watch for is did I make all the units cancel out? If you made all the units cancel out, and every one of your conversions, the top is equal to the bottom, then you almost certainly did it right. The number of places where you could make all the units cancel out and have every conversion be true and not be getting the right answer is very, very small in this class, even if it seems counterintuitive sometimes. All you have to do is make the units cancel out. All right, what are some other ways? Yeah, Chase. Well, part of it, we write a US for gold. Can we take that as literally as it's there next to the liters and the grams? This is more just to, for the problem statement. Yeah. The rest of these conversions are true whether it's gold or not. The, but the density, that's only true if it's gold, mm -hmm. right? We couldn't use the same conversion if we were talking about water. So with that in mind, it's most important when you're when you're doing something like using a density to keep track of. I'm talking about gold because yeah. everything else is just a standard conversion. You don't have enough like in the conversions. So you look at gold. You could you could put AU on each of these. But you, yeah. But the only one where it matters that it's gold is that density. Okay. That's what I do tend to get a little sloppy sometimes when I do that because it doesn't really matter for these other ones. All right, what else could we, could we do that? What are some other examples? Ratios, percentages, or even more. I won't call them strange, but less common ratios like parts per million or parts per billion. Those are still, they are conversions. You just have to be clear with what parts we're talking about. Ronnie? What about fractions? Fractions. Fractions are conversions too, right? If I say that each person is going to eat a quarter of a pizza, that means that we can write that out and say, okay, one person is equal to a quarter of a pizza, or what's the way we can rewrite that in a way that's not, that doesn't use a fraction there? I didn't mean that. I mean, one pizza is four people. We multiply both sides by four. We get four people equals one pizza. And since we want to make it clear that we're not talking about making a pizza out of people, maybe we want to see one pizza eaten. Never a bad idea to give a little context, right? That ratio, that one to four ratio, is a conversion because we can say these two things are true, or these two things equal to are equal to each other. We're making an assumption about how much pizza people eat. But as long as we know that this is an assumption, this is an approximate number, it's not a bad assumption. If we wanted to be really clear, 
like maybe we're off by one piece of pizza, maybe four, four people have one slice of pizza left. We could say 1.0 pizzas eaten. We probably don't want to say 4.0 people because we don't want to get into dealing with a tenth of a person. That gets weird. But we can deal with a tenth of a pizza. Um, so percentages are just ratios multiplied by 100, right? We could, there's no reason why we couldn't multiply both sides by 100 here and say for every, or even here, multiply by 100 and say for every 100 people equals 25. So 0.25 multiplied by 100, right? Equals 25 pizzas eaten. So percentages are just these ratios that for whatever reason, it's more convenient to multiply by 100 in order to make it more measurable numbers. So 30% fat by mass means for every 100 grams of food, there's 30 grams of fat. Parts per million is just percentage, except instead of multiplying by 100, you multiply by a million. So I think the next example, I have it in a second. Um, prices or conversions. We could say the price of gas. I need to update these prices apparently. Um, wouldn't that be nice if we were back down to 415 a gallon? Um, so if we want, if we do that, say 400 or 400, $4.15 equals one gallon of gas. That's a conversion too, right? Or we could say $17 equals one pizza. We can come back to this. So Sean, we can use multiple conversions in a row that we're kind of making up on the fly. We say that we are gonna, we need one pizza for every four people and it's $17. So currency is weird with the way they write their units. I typically, when I use a dollar sign, I'll throw it after the number just because every other unit goes after the number. So why would we write it in front? Technically, the more correct way to do this would be to write 17 USD equals one pizza, short for US dollar. Um, it'd be the more accurate way to do that. But we just kind of made these up, right? We estimated. And we might quibble about how much pizza that somebody actually is going to eat or what the price is, where are we ordering our pizza? If we're ordering from Domino's, it's not $17 for a pizza. But this allows us to answer this approach, making up these conversions allows us to answer some, um, to use conversions to answer word problems really easily, right? We have, I don't call it 40 people in this room. Now 40 is too round of a number. We have 39 people in this room. How much does it cost to buy enough pizza for everybody in the room? It's just a conversion problem. Right? For every four people, we need one pizza. And for every one pizza, it's going to cost us $17. So again, this is one that you probably could use your intuition and figure out how to punch it into a calculator, do this or do it in your head. This is how you show your work. 39 divided by four times 17. How much money does it cost to feed the, to have a pizza party in this room? $165.75. cents. What do we do with our uncertainty there? How many sig figs do we get to keep? Probably just two sig figs, right? So around 55. So we're probably, let's say that we actually went through and counted people and 39 people in this room. This is an exact number then, right? But we could be off by 
there's probably only two sig figs on this, like we mentioned. It's probably 1.0 pizzas for four people. It could be off there. We're, we're not off by an entire pizza, though, right? It's not like four. I, I mean, I guess we could be, depending on your appetites. But let's assume we made a better assumption there. And we could easily be off by a dollar here, though, right? So let's call it two sig figs. Does money have uncertainty? Do prices have uncertainty? Yeah. What happens with that? What's the tax sales tax right now? It might be up that high. I, don't, I remember when I first learned about sales taxes, it was seven and a quarter percent. Might be dating myself. Um, it's, but it's 7.25, it's 8.25? 8.75. Well, if we're going to take this number and multiply by 8.75 or 0.0875, since it's a percentage, we're going to get a weird decimal off the end, right? Which we're going to have to round to get it down to cents, right? So money does have uncertainty. Everybody's seen office space, right? Those little extra bits of pennies that get rounded off, the bank rounds off at the end of the day. That's, that's a real thing. There is uncertainty associated with interest and associated with money in general, which is why gas stations can get away with writing $4.15 at nine tenths of a penny. You know, if you look at their sites, it's always in nine tenths. But you can't actually pay with a thousandth of a dollar. There's no such thing as a tenth of a penny coin. They round it. I'll give you a spoiler alert. They never round it in your favor. I'm not going to get too much into economics and railing against cor corporate America and banks and things like that. But yeah, no, those extra tenths of a penny that they're talking about in office space, those are real. They always go to the bank. The bank would notice really, really quickly if they were gone. The bank relies on those um, to make their, their money at the end of the year. Uh, maybe not, not back before Y2K, but they definitely do now. All right, so what that means is really for a cost for buying pizza for the room, the 170 plus or minus 10, not even counting tip, but that's, that actually now starts sounding like a reasonable amount, right? We wouldn't try to order pizza with only $165.75 exactly, because we know it's not gonna come out to that. And anybody who's ever ordered food for the table knows that that's not how it works. There's uncertainty with how you order food. Odd as that sounds. So if we wanted to say how much gas could I, could I buy with $40? Let's assume we were living back in the golden age of $4.15 a gallon. How, much, how many gallons of gas could we get for $40? How would we use that as a conversion? We want to cancel out dollars, right? So what goes on bottom? 415. So we're going to get something just under 10, right? Nine point six three nine. That's what I got. Okay. And then okay. That's, our conversion. that's cool. that's why I brought up money has uncertainty over there, right? This has uncertainty too, right? Because it's not really exactly four dollars and fifteen cents. It's four dollars and fourteen cents and nine tenths of a penny. So yeah, so that is three sig figs. So we only get to keep three sig figs, which would make it six four. Then it sounds like. So whether or not you want to just be able to ignore uncertainty once you get done with this class, part of my job is to make sure that you will always be thinking about the uncertainty in numbers from here on out. No number is exact. The world is not black and white. Everything is gray. How 
with the modern process prices, it would work the same way, right? You just take out 415, put in, I don't know, whatever, 615 now, right now, up here anyway. I think even Sacramento is really high. I heard there's some, some issue with the refineries on the West Coast. The whole West Coast has really high gas prices right now. And the margin is like low, 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 low. Car stands, but that's because yeah. um, oh, they don't pay as much in taxes, which is also why they're not building as many uh, charging stations for electric cars, paving the roads as well, things like that. Um, so I do, despite how much it costs, it hurts me every time. I try to buy my gas in California anyway, just on principle. That doesn't mean that I I want my under a quarter of a tank. I better fill up in Carson on my way back. Dang, I have to spend less money. All right. Mm. Let's do one with parts per million. So the way that, that water quality gets reported, um, anybody who's ever done any home brewing with tap water um, knows that it matters a lot what ions, what minerals are dissolved in your tap water if you're gonna try to revere with it because yeast is very particular and the, uh, the flavor of hops depends, the way your, your body um, can sense the shape of the hop oils, the molecular shape, depends on what the ratio of certain ions are, in particular sulfates versus chlorides, will change how hoppy a hoppy beer tastes. If you brew it with different water, you get a different beer. Um, so with that in mind, anytime you're gonna brew anything, including kombucha or uh, even making coffee, water quality affects it. And when you look up the water quality, water quality is, is Presented as parts per million, they don't. They technically get a little bit fast and loose with the units. They're assuming the density of water to one in places, and so they can just use grams of water interchangeably with milliliters of water, which we know is not technically true if we want enough sig figs now. But let's say it's parts per million by mass. You look up your water quality, and it's 175 parts per million by mass magnesium ions. What that means is for every million grams of water, there's 175 grams of magnesium. So if you have 10 kilograms of water, how many grams of magnesium is that? Think about that for a second and then we'll work through it and then we'll take our break. Or actually, here's what we'll do. We'll come back at, I will start working through the solution at 10 after two. So either take your break, come back and start thinking about it, or start thinking about it now before you take your break. Try and solve this. You're not turning anything in, but try and figure out how to do this yourself before I work it through with you. Okay? Ready, break. <laughs> Yeah, I'm going to take air. Then I'll come back over here. <laughs> so, go down to X. And hit the back. Go back to home. Engineering might be that it would go to switch to scientific notation and it needs to and be regular if it doesn't. But at least you know how to get to scientific notation. Kind of make it sure the way you send it for it's like a bunch of tricks. It just this is the best way I can do it. So okay, so the trick with this, I'm just gonna do it up on the screen here. Yeah, yeah. So we have three different types of measurements. And I'm just going to fill in random numbers. Mm -hmm. 
So, and I'll just, I'll just do it with two groups. Yeah. Um, if we want everything that we measured with the graduated cylinder to have the same X value, we just plug in a fake X value. Basically, you can think of it as just like a categorization number. And so then when we, when we do a plot, it's still just a scatter plot. When you go to select data, you select your X's, you do that. And then you select your Y's, and they'll all show up on top of each other. Oh, that just happens there. Right? And so then if we wanted to do if we wanted to do for a pipette, we would just need to move these over. And one way you can do that is just by highlighting what you want to move over and then hit insert, and it'll add a group there. We want them to have a different X value, so we just plug in two. Yeah, cool. Okay, sweet. No Uh, yeah, so I'm doing the Excel and then you get a Never mind. All right. If you, if you use Sheets or if you use the online version of Excel, uh, okay. So you should be fine, but occasionally what you have to do is just stack them on top of each other so that they're all in the same columns. It's true. The trick is you still have to show on them. So when you go to select data for your series name, you can just click on a cell and it can change the cell says it'll change the, the name. Um, and so if I wanted to make it more um, more specific. Um, and then if you right click on it, or if you go up to chart design and go to add chart element, you can add a legend. And then if you wanted to, if you value your space, you can also do things like format legend and you can let it overlap.
There are a couple ways to do it. Usually, what you do is you add something to it that that makes it so that ions will not stay in all the water. So you can mix it on to precipitate, and when you get it to precipitate out, um, you can measure the masses of the precipitates out. Because like there are things that, will, that sulfates will just get out of it, but fluorides won't. Right. And you test it that way. Right. right, not just negative ions in general, but fluorides versus sulfates. It's true. Well, they have to get some work in. You have to report um, what they tested basically. Like, you know that um, right where um, black mark goes into the air trying to go back to that well there. Oh. They test at the wells that go into the neighborhood. So they oh. treat it at, at the central treatment. They don't test it there because they test it once it gets to the other things. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it used to be, I used to, I used to brew with the tap water around here, but then. I don't know if it's just now we have more people or more water, fresh water burden, um, less water around. Um, but now they have more water to get the water to the point they can get to it. I should have used You use that water? I use tap water. Then I add these Yeah. For the most part, I had good luck with that, but I had a couple of batches towards the end when I stopped growing where. Or it was definitely off quicker, so I think it was an hour because I started going to do this with water uh, oh. from the grocery store and just adding what I needed. Yeah. Uh, if you can buy all the time, so it was like we're ready for that. And it's going to be good. So you got to do it. You got to learn from God's fear, but you don't have soft water. You have to add the stuff to make it soft water. Yeah. So. There's so many questions to do it. Oh, I know. I know. Yeah. Well, so only because you use different conversions. It should be exact or exactly. 10 kilograms is exactly 10,000 grams, but because we use approximate conversions, it will not have to change it. Because if you use the conversion that says one kilogram equals 10 to the three grams, then you'll get an exact answer. Yeah, so when you can, if you can avoid using the approximate conversions, you should. So, and in this case, it's just because it's kilo. It does a kilogram, it doesn't have that song. It's 10 to the third, yeah. Yeah, you just, you just move the dot up three places. And that's where it is. So right. you can add the dot up on the three places, then you move it up one more, and that's your answer. Kind of, because it's 10, right? So you divide the way you get for one 10 times. Every time you just one more. 
So not the 175 or 10 kilograms. Let's assume we're doing two stick bakes on the 10 kilograms. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, just go to the white screen here. If we want to go kilograms to grams, first of all, we don't have to do that before we use our other one, but it's convenient to do it on gram to switch to grams. We know how to do that. One kilogram is 10 to the third grams, and so we'll get 1.0 times 10 to the four grams. So in this just for anybody else joining in, this came up because you can use the other, the approximate conversions that are on your conversion chart to go 10 kilograms into pounds and then pounds into grams. But those are both approximate. And when you do that, you get 9,999 9, grams is equal to 10 kilograms because of uncertainty in rounding. So instead, we stick to only using exact conversions as much as possible. We run into that issue less. Um, because, and then if we took that 9,999 9, 9, grams, put it back into kilograms using the exact conversion, you can actually wind up saying 10 kilograms is equal to 9.999 kilograms, which seems like a contradiction, right? But it's within sig figs. So it's not technically a contradiction, but we can do better than that. So we might as well. And so this is grams. We started with 10 kilograms of water, right? So now we've got 10,000 grams of water in our conversion that was given. It said 175 ppm magnesium 2 plus. Writing that as a conversion is we can say, okay, a million grams or 10 to the six grams of water is equal to 175 grams of magnesium. All right, the, and the other reason, just in terms of, of taste, um, when you're brewing beer, you actually need to match the grains, meaning you have to convert, you have to heat up the grains in water and let some enzymes that are naturally present in all the barley break down starches to make sugars because yeast can't digest starch, but it can digest the small sugars that you get when starch gets chopped up. If you're at the wrong pH, those enzymes don't work. Your starch doesn't get converted to sugar, which means your yeast doesn't have anything to break down and produce alcohol. So if you use the wrong water, in the wrong grain combination, you can wind up trying to make beer and getting something that tastes like really, really sweet, gross, barley flavored water. It's like it's like syrup almost. Um, which I think actually in, in parts of the Caribbean they actually sell a like a malted barley flavored soda. Um, I tried it once; it's kind of gross, um, but that's my personal preference. Um, if you have too much magnesium or too much calcium in your water, it'll throw off the pH of your mash, which means you don't make beer. You make gross, sweet, syrupy stuff. <clears throat> you just get wort that never actually ferments. Um, so if this is going to be our conversion here, so we get back on track. We have... 10,000 grams of water, and every million grams of water would be 175 grams of magnesium. This is our conversion. So we can say 1.0 times 10 to the four grams of water, and every million grams of water is 175 grams of magnesium. So we wind up taking our 10,000, divide by a million, multiply by 175, and we get, what, 1.75 grams, I think, right? Unless I slipped a digit somewhere. How many sig figs do we get to keep? There's the two. 175 is measured, so that might limit us, but we only had two, two sig figs to begin with in our 10 kilograms of water. So we actually get, 
grams of magnesium in 10 kilograms of water. Jeff? Is there a guess point behind the zero on the 10 kilograms at the start? Wouldn't it just be one without decimal? Okay. Yes. Uh, yeah, I gave you one that was not an exact, that it was an uh, ambiguous number. <clears throat> so I went through and, and added that decimal point. <clears throat> All right, so percentages, parts per million, parts per billion, all of those work the same way. It's always going to be for every hundred or every million. There's even parts per thousand. It's just not that commonly used. Typically, we just keep it in percentages if we're doing parts per, per thousand. But that is also a, a viable ratio unit. Um, it just means for every set amount of something, you get some amount of, and it's, usually, it's always going to be the same unit. And so it actually doesn't matter what unit you're using as long as it's the same top and bottom, and it's the same type of unit. So we come back here, it says parts per million by mass. That means you can actually take any mass unit as long as it's the same on top and bottom of your ratio and it'll still work. So we could do this and for every million pounds of water, it's 175 pounds of magnesium. You could do it in grams, you could do it in kilograms as long as it's the same on top and bottom and percentages work the same way. 30% fat by mass, for every 100 grams of food is 30 grams of fat, or 100 pounds of food is 30 pounds of fat. Makes it sound a lot grosser. Like 30 grams of fat, okay, that's, that, that doesn't sound all that healthy, but when you say 30 pounds of fat, visualize what 30 pounds of butter looks like. <laughs> Key with these is these. These conversions, the ones that are that are dependent on being given extra information, so densities, prices, um, percentages, they're pretty much always measured numbers, which means you have to worry about their sig figs at the end, right? It's just if it's on your conversion sheet and it's exact, infinite sig figs. If it's a measured number. You have to pay attention to it. Let's do another one where we have to estimate something. Let's make up our own conversions, like we did for pizza. Let's say one serving of gummy bears is 17 delicious little bears and has 140 calories, plus or minus 10 calories. If you ate two handfuls of gummy bears, how many calories is that? What do we need to know? How many handfuls are in a serving or how many bears in a handful? I mean, I'm thinking of the, you know, the gold bag Rebo ones. That's, that's my wife's favorite. So I'm picturing those and, and I'm picturing my hands. And I would say if I'm grabbing a handful of gummy bears, uh, probably 25 maybe. I don't know, I've got, I've got greedy hands. Your hands might be different. But we do have to make an assumption here and turn it into a conversion. One handful equals 25 bears. Now we can answer this question, right? So what does it look like? How would we write it out? Start by canceling handfuls out. We say, okay, two handfuls. Well, one handful is 25 bears. We canceled out handfuls, now we're in bears. Now what do we do? Cancel out bears with what? 17 bears, what do we write on top? 
we could say 140 calories equals 17 bears, or we could say 17 bears equals one serving and one serving equals 140 calories. Should get us to the same point though, right? certain scientific notation so we don't need to worry about the uncertainty and it's totally reasonable to combine those two and make it 17 bears equals 104 1.4 times 10 to the 2 calories Again, something if I just gave you this word problem, you could probably figure out roughly how to, to get a number. But being able to show your work like this means you can be more confident that you plug your numbers into the calculator, right? All right, so 50 divided by 17, uh, three and a half times 140. We're looking at what about 500 calories? I'm calling that close to 500 for doing that in my head. We're only going to keep two sig figs, right? Because we only have two sig figs here. It's a counting number, but we only have two sig figs there as well, right? But it's a counting number, but when you think about one serving, it's 17 bears. When you look at the nutritional facts, a lot of times they'll say about 17 bears, right? Or, you know, about, it's about six chips is in a serving of Doritos or something like that, right? Because every chip is a slightly different size. But your uncertainty right there too, and very easily be off by a bear of my handful estimate, right? I'm probably not off by 10 bears. There's no way that it, I could be off by an entire 10 bears on my estimate of a handful. I don't, I don't think. Maybe I could, but maybe we only should get one sick big bear. Jack? So if it gives us the uncertainty is plus or minus 10, can we just keep that as our towards our answer as well? As long as there's nothing else that has less uncertainty. Or fewer sick days, I should say. So, interesting fact about nutritional facts nutritional facts have sick days built into them. They're usually plus or minus. Um, they actually don't follow real science rules for sick days. I think they're usually plus or minus five calories, not plus or minus 10. But that's actually how they can get away calling diet sodas zero calories. Zero calories within sink phase. Your body actually does get some calories from breaking down artificial sweeteners, but artificial sweeteners taste so much sweeter to your tongue. You need about 300 times less, say, aspartame or saccharin compared to sugar. So if you need 300 times less, that means you have 300 times fewer calories as well, right? And so if it was 150 calories in a can of soda, now it's half a calorie in a can of soda, but it's not zero. It's just zero within six days. The other fun thing is that, remember how I keep, I keep harping on capitalization? This is capital cap C calories, which is, I'm going to go off about Americans for a second. America, um, we only use this as a unit because Americans are allergic to metric prefixes. It should be kcals. It's a kilo calorie, but because Americans don't like kilo in front of their units, they just say, well, we're going to call it a nutritional calorie and we're going to capitalize the C. And it means it's a thousand regular calories. But if you're ever wondering when you're reading nutritional facts from something that you can buy from Mexico versus in the US, 
In Mexico, it's usually labeled as KCALs. And the same thing in the US will be labeled with calories with a capital C. And that's why we just don't like kilo. Um, and it does mean that they're being a little bit underhanded because one lowercase calorie is the amount of energy it takes to raise one gram of water, one degree Celsius. A nutritional calorie is enough energy to raise a kilogram of water, one degree Celsius. So a regular calorie, a real calorie is a really small amount of energy, but a kilocalorie is actually a lot of energy, just one of them. Um, so nutritionally, if you eat 2000 nutritional calories a day, that's enough energy to raise one kilogram of water by 2000 degrees. And we don't burn it all at once, luckily. But you did, you would see like you can take a gummy bear and have it go through a chemical reaction where it releases all the energy at once. Basically, you burn the gummy bear. And it's really, really just one gummy bear is a lot of energy um, in terms of how much you can raise one gram of water. Anyway. Occasionally, I'm gonna have you do word problems. Usually I try to do without explicitly telling you, I will, I will tell you, you may need to estimate some numbers or look up some numbers in order to, to solve this problem. I'll usually try to give you everything you need, but some, some of the word problems that you'll get in this class that you have to do something like, well, what's, how much is a handful? And use that to try and figure out something. You have to make an assumption. So part of showing your work in that case is writing out, I'm assuming that this is true. Keeping track of what assumptions you're making is part of being diligent in sciences because you need to know where you could be wrong, right? It's possible, I don't think it's likely, but it's possible I'm way off in a handful of gummy bears is seven gummy bears. I'm probably not that far off. So I like, I like gummy bears, but it's possible. So you have to be aware of those assumptions. We'll skip that one for now. All right, let's talk about when we're dealing with quote unquote higher powers of units. Let it never be said that scientists don't believe in higher powers. We deal with squares and cubes all the time. So if we have a unit that we're familiar with, but it's squared or cubed, that changes a little bit how we do conversions. Our conversions that we know still apply, but it gets a little bit weird because we think about a box that's one inch by one inch. We wanna figure, and we can, we can convert each of those into centimeters, right? And get, 2.54 centimeters and 2.54 centimeters. The area of that box, when it's in inches, the area of that box is one square inch, right? What's the area of that box in, in um, square centimeters? It's not one anymore, right? And it's not 2.54. The area of the box is now 2.54, oh, what happened to my pen? Two point five four centimeters by two point five four centimeters. So in other words, the area of this square is now is six point four five centimeters squared. If you want to convert areas between square inches and square centimeters, or square inches and square feet, or square feet and square miles, all of our C conversions still apply, but you have to do it to both sides of the box. Right? You have to multiply the length and then you have to convert the width. Right? So, what do we do if it's not a nice, neat shape? Well, we can still approximate it 
if I say that something has is I don't know thirty six. Thirty six square inches, and it's I don't know. It's oval shaped. It's the shape of a, the outline of a gummy bear. Doesn't really matter what the shape is. It's got the same area. We can do the math to convert the units as though it was a nice, neat six by six box. We can say, okay, well, I'm going to take that and I'm going to rewrite it as a box that's six inches by six inches. And I can convert both of their nose to centimeters. And then I could square them again, right? We don't always want to do that. We don't necessarily want to take the square root of a number, convert it twice, and then convert and then square it again. The faster way, the more efficient way is to just convert both powers of square inches. Instead of writing it like this, we can just say, okay, well, I'm going to convert, I'm going to cancel out inches and be left in centimeters. But that doesn't cancel out both of those powers. Inches squared is inches times inches, right? So we want to cancel out, we have to cancel out both of those. If we do that, if we only did it once, we actually would wind up in units of centimeters times inches, which isn't all that helpful, right? Nobody wants to do any math with centimeters times inches as your unit. So we just make sure we do it twice. And we cancel out both powers of inches and we're left in centimeters times centimeters or centimeters squared. What's the more compact way of writing this? To the power of two, right? We could write it like this every time, but I think we're already getting sick of taking up all an entire row of your binder paper for a conversion, right? No need to add extra writing. If we're multiplying by the same conversion twice, do that. When you do that, remember that you square everything, not just the units. This is the number one place people mess up when they either they forget to do this and they'll just plug in one inch is 2.54 centimeters and cancel out both powers of inches at the same time, even though they only have one power of inch to work with. The other thing that people forget is they'll leave it at 2.54 and they'll say 2.54 centimeters squared is one inch squared. If you're gonna distribute the square, you have to square everything. So it's one inch squared, one squared, inch squared, 2.54 squared, centimeters squared. But because we started with an exact conversion, this is still an exact number. We get to keep all of those. Or you can just plug it into your calculator as 36 I guess if we're plugging into the calculator, we're not writing units, right? Thirty six times two point five four squared. That's exact, and we're squaring it with by multiplying by another exact number, so it's still exact. Which means we still just have our two sig figs from the thirty six inserted, right? So we can still use exact conversions if we're converting higher powers of units. We just have to use an exponent. All right, so this also applies when we're doing volume. Um, but we'll talk about volume in a second. Let's say we have a piece of property that's listed as 2,500 
52 acres. How many square miles is that? Why do you need to know what an acre is first and not just the amount of land that one person can plow in a day by hand? So we have a number for it. This is an exact number. One acre is 43,560 square feet. So how do we figure out how many square miles it is? Start with acres to feet. We have a conversion directly. We're not even going to need to mess with, the, with squaring it. Right? 2,552 acres. AC is the abbreviation for acres. One acre is 43,560 feet squared. And we don't need to square this, right? We're converting an area, but this area already has the squared involved. Just like with our cubic inches and gallons earlier, right? We didn't need to mess with cubing that because the conversion already had the cubic inches in it. I suppose we could get an answer there, or we could just keep going and say 5,280 feet is one mile squared. Are we? Oh, yes, we are. Not square miles. Sorry. I just misread that. Oh, okay. Sorry. We'll do the top one first, and then we'll do square meters. Like, I swear, I saw miles on there somewhere. So, 2552 times 43,560 divided by 5,280 squared. And remember, your order of operations is already built into your calculator. So, if you, put, if you use squared, it's going to automatically square this one before it does the dividing. Um, or you can just put divided by 5,280, divided by 5,280. That does the same thing mathematically, right? What do we get for a number? Uh, 3.98. 98 what? Uh, 3.988. 988, good. Because we are gonna keep four sig figs, right? We only use exact conversions here. because it's kind of hard to see. That's a decimal point. So four square miles. It seems like a lot of acres for a very small number of square miles, right? But when, you, when you're gonna divide by 5,000 twice, there are a lot of acres in a square mile. Which is why we're living in California especially the we're really used to seeing really big numbers of acres, right? And then if you say it's like 75,000 uh, acres for a mosquito fire, that's not actually that many square miles because a square mile is really, really big. So then why do they use acres as the unit for like mountains and skiing, skiable acres? Because they want it to sound like a big number. Uh, because it, because if you think about it from a marketing standpoint, right? Yeah. You said you have four square miles of skiing, like that, that is a lot, but it doesn't sound like a lot when you say it's four. It's just bigger numbers are thought of as being big, good for marketing purposes. If we want to put it into square meters, no different than converting feet to meters, right? We just have to square everything along the way. So 2552 acres 
acres to feet. 43,560 feet squared. Where should we go to get to meters? It's really two options that are about the same length. Might as well use the exact one then, right? So we go one foot, it's 12 inches squared. One inch is 2.54 centimeters squared. Now just one step left, right? Ten to the two centimeters is one meter squared. So it's this is one place where the, where squaring the units and the prefixes will make it easy to mess up your intuition because. How many square centimeters are in a square meter? The hint it's not a hundred, not even a thousand, it's 10,000. 10 to the four centimeters squared are in a meter squared. And how many, how many cubic centimeters are in a cubic meter? A hundred three times, right? So that's going to be 10 to the 6 cubic centimeters in one cubic meter. So a million centimeters squared cubed in one meter cubed. Right? So watch out for those higher powers of units. Make it easy to mess yourself up with the prefixes. Because you'd be, oh, centi, 100, boom, I'm done. Watch out. What do we get for a number here? How far? Times 10 to the four. So, so when we have that big of a difference between the two numbers, we're we'll still reasonable in this check. All we're trying to do with this reasonable in this check is in our head is get close to what power of 10 is it going to be. There we go. But just for the sake of practice, we had 2,500 times, call that 50,000. Might as well just call that 1,000 for the sake of doing it in our head, right? We have 10 to the 3 times 10 to the 4. So that's going to give us 10 to the 7 times 100-ish. So that's 10 to the 9 times another 10-ish. Now we're 10 to the 10 divided by 10 to the 4. So 10 to the 6 ish with all of that rounding just doing it just by powers of 10 that tells us our answer should be something like 10 to the 6 we actually see 10 to the 7 that's pretty close considering all the rounding we did especially considering i rounded down for pretty much all of them all right so the quiz this weekend has you on I think some, some basic conversion, a couple of short word problems, and one involving mileage, using mileage as a conversion. You think about how miles per gallon might be used as a conversion. Um, and it'll go live, I think, tonight at midnight or tomorrow morning, one of the two. Um, if you check, it'll tell you when, when you can start taking it. All right, any questions? I got office hours till four. Um, so if I'm not in my office, I'm here to answer your questions, I suppose. Otherwise, if you have anything to ask me about, I'm fine. Thank you.